Kitchen for your introduction and uh, welcome everybody. Um, at Durham University there is a series of events happening today. Uh, I've already attended one and I'm very much looking forward uh, to this one as well. Um, International Women's Day takes place every year on the, on the 8th of March. Um, it's, it's a global day uh, celebrating the the social, the economic, the cultural um, and the political and the personal achievements of women. I think that's important to say. Um, so we've got this series of events that we're working on today and, and this is one of them. The panel that we have today, and I'm going to introduce you to them in just a minute, um, explores women's leaderships, uh, leadership in the times of uh, COVID-19. Um, much of the discussion of women during um, the pandemic has been on the disproportionate effects of the pandemic on women and girls. So for example, the UN Women has outlined how the pandemic has exposed and in some cases really worsened, exacerbated the structural inequalities that women face, structural inequalities in health and access to healthcare, which obviously, as well as being something that women experience, is also experienced differentially around the globe, differences between East and West and North and South. There's also the disproportionate amount of service that's carried out by women. Um, we are carers, we are frontline workers, we are in the service industries, we face the public and we face their good humour and also their bad humour. And in times of the pandemic, that bad humour has been more prevalent and women therefore have suffered the consequences of that dif differentially from the rest of the population. The economic impact is also made worse because many of the industries where women do have these jobs are industries which have been closed for long periods of time where colleagues have been furloughed and at best made redundant at worst and we don't know exactly how that's going to pan out in the longer term with businesses potentially going under for a very long period of time um, which will have another disproportionate effect on the economic well-being of women. And of course, there is the very important area of the unpaid work that women do, unpaid work of caring, uh, often for children, often for elderly relatives, or even for neighbours, and the way in which women will rise to those um, the challenges when a whole community is under threat from something as uh, widespread as this pandemic has been. It's incredibly important that we take on board uh, many of these uh, factors when we think about uh, how the pandemic does shape women's lives. And it's important that women leaders uh, are able to share their stories um, and their insights when we have experts such as we have today. We know that women have been taking on leadership roles of many kinds and that perhaps those leadership roles, which are not the traditional top of the organization, leadership roles will be recognised for what they are. Uh, it's very much something that's important to me um, in my leadership role um, as well. Um, the fact that we can look at leadership at all levels in an organisation and at all levels in society does open up the space to talk about leadership and talk about diversity of leadership. Uh, what does a, a leader look like? Um, what does leadership really involve? What does count as success? What is commonly seen to be success and what actually is uh, success? Um, this morning's um, talk was very, very interesting because it showed really the power of collaborative approaches to work um, and how productive that can be and how can we take that forward um, in the future. Just by way of something about my, my own self um, in terms of the leadership roles that I have occupied and do occupy, um, there's a piece in the Poets and Quants, which is a, uh, for those of you not in the world of business schools, is a, um, a, is a website that looks at the positive, uh, poetic, artistic elements of business school development, to put it that way. Um, and there's a number of quotes from 12 female deans in that uh, published today that are all very interesting. My own view of this is that I can achieve nothing without others. There is absolutely not, there is no I. There is, there's not an I, there's only a we. And the important thing in leadership is to activate that we um, and actually allow that we get out of the way of that we to activate itself because it often will and it will often do it more effectively, more willingly, uh, with greater impact than a directional approach to that. I think another very important element of uh, my experience in the, in the pandemic that sometimes put me at odds with elements of leadership has been that there's a concept called holding 
the idea that you don't, we were gripped this time last year with the sudden enormity of what this pandemic was about to unleash on us all. And many reactions to that where, and understandably so about what can we do? We must do something. And, and there's a focus on immediate swift action to try and protect everybody from that, much of which is good. But when you're in an organization, it's important that you are able, I think, to hold that organization in a moment of consideration to say, there may be things, there will be things we have to do, but for now, what we have to do is make sure that people feel held, that they feel supported in the roles. And the fact that we're about, and we were about and have embraced a huge amount of change in our personal and professional lives, but to know that the people that are charged with leadership formally are with you on that. And I don't mean that by lip service. I'm very aware as I'm saying this, how lip servicey it sounds, but that is actually about being able to say and, and hold yourself back as a leader from telling people what to do or what they should do, but rather be there for them in an understanding that you know they will do their best and that you're there to understand that. And that's something that I've tried to do um, and it's very much been at the front of my mind and sometimes it is interpreted as a lack of action by others in a leadership role and it's not and I feel it's very important so that's been some of the elements of my truth not overreacting um, doing a lot of sharing of our own personal circumstances with the people that you're close to in a, in a professional sense um, people that you work with understand that you know you're human too and that your backside gets sore at the end of the day after a zoom meeting after a zoom meeting after a zoom meeting and you still have as they do all the emails to attend to and you know what you're not going to get them all done so let's just leave it at that and be kind to one another on that and of course that engenders another important aspect that I think is is crucial and that's laughter when appropriate so um at the business school we are wholly committed uh, to establishing ourselves as a business school that does um, appreciate, promote um, and is passionate about diversity and equality of opportunity. It's very much, huh. I've just gone completely blank there everybody, I don't know whether you all have. We can Hello? still hear you Susan, but okay, you're so everything on my screen, including the names of people has now gone completely blank and I have no idea thing is um so you see this kind of thing happens all the time so you really cannot be there we go I've got you back now is my is my laptop coming back I hope it is bit by bit <laughs> so this kind of thing happens all the time doesn't it so that's why one of the very real uh, examples of why you can't be too dogged about um going forward yes everything has now decided to reboot itself amazing um but back to the business school, what's really important to us um, is, and it's, it's enshrined in our, in, our, in our mission, that we seek to develop and enthuse leaders and entrepreneurs who create, share and use knowledge, because we're in the knowledge business, aren't we? Uh, but that knowledge is to deliver equitable and sustainable futures around the world. And that's an important mission that we have right at the heart, our heart of what we do. So it is an important element. It's been changed forever by the pandemic, but I'm delighted to introduce the two speakers who are real experts in their, in their own rights uh, on the panel today. The first is uh, Dr. Supriya Gari, I'm gonna get this wrong this time, <laughs> Gari Kipati. Did I get that right? Not bad. Okay, um, and uh, Dr. Gariki Patti is a reader in development economics from the University of Liverpool. A very warm welcome uh, to you. And um, her expertise is on the interplay between economic policy and gender. Uh, and um, Supriya is going to be speaking about women's leadership. Is it better or is it just different? And then considering um, COVID-19 as a test case, she's rekindling the debate on what successful leadership means and what the traits of good leaders are uh, and what they uh, develop in themselves. Our very own Professor Jackie Ford is Professor of Leadership and Organization Studies at Durham University. She has expertise um, in critical organization studies, gender and organizational theory. Jackie's going to speak on women leadership organizations and COVID-19, um, where she's going to be taking the time to explore gender in, in leadership uh, on organizations and looking at the future implications and implications for better futures. So I'm going to hand over uh, to the, the panel now. Um, it's going to be chaired by Gretchen, um, who is Associate Professor of Marketing at Durham University, and who is, as she said, our faculty lead for equality, diversity and inclusion. 
Gretchen, if I can hand over to you now. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Susan, for a fantastic introduction there and your thoughts on um, your own role as a leader throughout this process as well. Um, I'm, I, I could see many of the panel nodding and I'm sure many of the people listening in today will have been nodding along as well. Um, just briefly before I ask um, Supriya to, to, um, to uh, present, um, just uh, in terms of timing, um, we're, Supriya will speak for around about 20 minutes. Um, after which we'll have a, a short um, Q&A opportunity then to ask any questions that are perhaps directly relating to Supriya's presentation. Um, and then after that, we'll move on to Jackie's presentation, who will also speak for about 20 minutes. And then we'll go move on to a, um, the Q&A for the remainder of the session. So that's probably going to be around 25 minutes or so. Um, so I'd like to hand over to Supriya now. Um, and I think, Supriya, you're sharing your screen with us as well. Uh, yes, I'll be doing that. Thank Super. you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for that generous introduction, Susan. And thank you very much for having me here today. It's, it's an absolute pleasure. Um, I would like to share my screen because I have some slides, which just makes the presentation a bit more nicer rather than having to see my face all the time. Um, could somebody indicate to me whether you can see the slides? Yes, that's it's visible. Okay, so just a sec. So if you remember the initial months of the ongoing pandemic, there was a lot of talk in the media about the effectiveness with which some women leaders were handling the COVID-19 crisis. So both Uma and I, who's my co-author, uh, we are gender economists, and we sort of got um, interested in this discussion in the media and decided to scrutinize this association more systematically. So really the goal of our study became to ask if there was a significant and systematic difference by gender of the national leader in the number of COVID cases and COVID deaths in the initial phases of the pandemic. Of course, the big problem that we had was the imbalance in the number of women and men-led countries. We had just 10% of our sample that had female leaders and the rest were led by men. Now, the biggest challenge here was to identify a methodology or a technique that would make our findings fair and reliable. And here we decided to use a novel application of the matching methodology, which is really a quasi-experimental technique, which is used in cases where samples are imbalanced between two different groups and where there might be other endogenous drivers of the um, interested outcomes. So where, here, intuitively speaking, what we did was we matched the women-led countries with men-led countries using a variety of covariates. The basic model that we used where, where we matched using wealth, which is GDP per capita, and we also used uh, demographic variables like population, population density, and population over 65, because these variables mattered for the transmission and the management of the virus. And then to check for the robustness of our results, we extended our model and we looked at other variables that would matter to this virus, which are health expenditure, openness to tourism, and also gender norms, because countries that elect female leaders might be more equitable and therefore might be in a better position to deal with emergencies. So we also controlled for gender norms. And what did we find? We found that women-led countries had significantly better outcomes in terms of fewer cases and fewer deaths. Now, as you can see there, we looked at nearest neighbor, but to check our robustness, we also looked at two nearest neighbors, three nearest neighbors, and also five nearest neighbors. That's not yet not, not reported in this table. Our results on deaths are stronger than our results on cases. And this kind of became a performance indicator. What this suggests is that although women-led countries were equally hard hit by the virus, they managed it better in terms of fewer fatalities. Um, and this finding really remained robust when we extended the model, the base model, to adding other covariates like health expenditure, openness to tourism, and gender norms. So our results remained robust. 
We also did various other robustness tests. Here I've presented one for you where we have sort of knocked out the countries that have been in the limelight. So uh, the results that you can see on your slides, on your screens now are the results without USA, without Germany and without New Zealand. So across the board, our results remain robust, although there is a difference in magnitude um, in number of um, uh, various estimates. So really, what is explaining these outcomes? What is driving our results? Now, in the study, we explore two ideas. The first idea that we look at is policies. Did the policies that women leaders adopt, were they markedly different from those adopted by male leaders? Now, if you cast back your minds, you will remember that there were very few policy instruments available to leaders. Testing, mass testing was not possible because of the dearth in uh, testing equipment. The only um, policy instrument available to leaders was lockdown. And then, of course, the only question remaining to be asked was the timing of the lockdown, where women leaders more efficient, more stringent, more fa faster to announce lockdowns. And then, indeed, we find that, yes, women leaders were indeed much more decisive with locking down their economies to put a number to it. Women leaders, on average, locked down their economies 24 deaths sooner than male leaders did. So male leaders just waited that much longer before they announced lockdowns of their economy. So why is this? Why have women leaders locked down their economies earlier? Is there any explanation for this? Now, in economics, um, and you might be aware of this iconic result, there is an argument that women are risk averse. This argument has been used and abused in various ways, sometimes used to deprive women of the high risk taking, high profit kind of opportunities. But in this case, we argue that actually the argument needs to be nuanced. Yes, definitely. It does seem that women leaders locked down their economies earlier because they were risk averse about loss to human life. But certainly by locking down their economies earlier, they've signaled that they are much more prepared to take risk as far as their economies are concerned. So when we are looking at risk aversion, there is a need to separate the domain of human life from the domain of the economy. As far as human lives are concerned, women were definitely risk averse, but they were prepared, they were risk taking as far as their economies are concerned. Of course, this dichotomy has ultimately proven to be a false one. Those who ended up saving lives have also um, ended up saving their economy as it turns out, but that's really a different matter. We also find that women are much more empathetic. So this, we, we have found studies elsewhere, for instance, in neuropsychology um, and in leadership literature, where leaders are meant to deal with a bit more empathy. We also found that men and women had different styles of leadership. And this style was most obvious in the communication techniques that they adopted. Women uh, adopted very interpersonal communication style. And sometimes this was very experimental. There are a number of examples of this. Jacinda Arden using Facebook Live to check in daily with her citizens. Erna Solberg uh, having a conference with children speaking directly to them. And Angela Merkel, uh, you know, really intuitively engaging with science to uh, justify fairly difficult emergency rules. We believe that this interpersonal style of communication resulted in greater compliance among the citizens, where they were more prepared to obey the emergency rules. So really, these are the two things, decisive uh, leadership and communicating the decisions well. This is where the uh, women leaders seem to be distinct from uh, their comparable matched male leaders. Now, really, what can we take away from this research? My hope is that this work and work like it rekindles the debate around successful leadership. Much of the dominant discourse within the leadership literature remains heavily masculinized. 
where leadership is associated with masculine attributes like assertiveness, authoritarianism. And this has influenced perceptions around how a leader should behave. Women are often asked to lean in and conform to behavior expected of a leader. Now, these impositions suggest an acceptance of the absolute dominance of certain traits of leadership that are always deemed as successful and which women must imbibe if they seek to succeed. Now, this research, however, suggests that it is more appropriate to view the success of leadership as being contextual, where certain traits may be better suited to tackling certain situations. And this really brings us to the importance of diversity in leadership, not merely as a signal of gender equality, which may have its own value, but actually to promote efficiency. Now, our result point at the idea that women's leadership is different and that in the context of the pandemic, which posed a very particular kind of challenge, this different style of leadership proved to be better. Now, given the challenges institutions and nations and universities face vary in their context and characteristics, it seems that it seems quite clear that diversity in leadership will prove to be a major advantage in managing and minimizing risks. So such diversity then not only simply as a matter of equity, but actually it is a matter of efficiency. So it is the diverse organizations, the diverse nations that are likely to be much more successful at tackling different types of um, challenges. I'll stop there. That's wonderful, Supriya. And I have to say, people may have picked up um, from my accent that I'm originally from New Zealand. So it always gives me a certain amount of pride to see so many photos of Jacinda Ardern and uh, with the fantastic work that she's been doing in, in New Zealand as well. Um, I'm just gonna check and see if there's any questions that have come through in the, the Q and A. Um, so please, for those of you who have joined us, um, please add your questions into the Q and A uh, session and that way we can um, ask them to, to our pa panelists today. Um, just a quick question, I think, from, from me, if, if I may, um, before we move on to, to Jackie's uh, presentation as well. Um, I'm quite interested in a way uh, with the discussion around, in a way, these almost personality characteristics of decisiveness and style of communication and whether or not in your analysis you might have looked at the male leaders to see whether those that have um, those kind of personality characteristics also maybe did better um, in the measures that you have used than m other male leaders that maybe didn't uh, express those particular um, approaches in their management of the, the COVID pandemic? That's a, that's a really pertinent question. We um, obviously started asking ourselves similar questions. And one of the things we found um, that might lend us some understanding about, you know, whether it's, it's obviously possible that women have male traits and equally that men have female traits of empathy, of communication and so on. So we have started analyzing uh, leaders' speeches and this has proven to be extremely enlightening. I mean, uh, obviously there are clear differences that, that come out. For instance, one stark difference is that women are likely to use empathetic language, twice as likely to use empathetic language when compared to the male leaders. But like you said, they are indeed male leaders who use the language of collective responsibility a lot. One of um, the findings of our research has been that Canada's uh, leader uses collective responsibility and the ideas of empathy a lot more than a lot of the female leaders in our sample. So you're right, they are indeed, I mean, I think there are these traits that are interesting and uh, anybody, men and women could equally imbibe these traits. What we need to recognize is that 
traditionally these traits have been seen to be not really associated with any success or any fantastic achievement. But in today's world, we are better able to recognize that these traits are useful. They are useful in workplace. They are, you know, they are, it's useful to have a colleague who is able to listen to you. You can avoid lots of situations by doing that. It's also useful to have these traits when you're dealing with a crisis like the pandemic, it seems. Uh, so yes, that's quite right. I mean, these are simply traits that anybody, both men and women can recognize. It's important to recognize that these, this is a good trait, not necessarily a bad one. Sure, thank you. We have a couple of questions that have come through on the Q&A now that I think because they're, they're specific to what you've spoken about, we might um, take, the, take a few minutes to have a look at those now. And I think following on from, um, what you were just talking about, there's a question here. Is it harder for men to adopt leadership that gets characterized as feminine or harder for women as they're in danger of confirming gender stereotypes? Um, I mean, our own work doesn't really throw much light on this, but I can tell you that the leadership literature is full of um, work on this. So we do find that women uh, who adopt male leadership traits are um, more accepted in leadership positions, but they are less liked. Uh, so there is a very big experiment in psychology where you know half the class is given uh, the uh, sort of a real um, characteristics of a person with a female name, and the other class is given the same characteristics, but the name has been changed to a, a male name. And the professor asked both sides of the class, both groups to answer two questions. How efficient is this person and how likable is this person? And what we find is both groups give the same score on efficiency, but the scores differ a lot on likability. The female name uh, secures a lot of hate kind of um, signal, whereas the male name turns out to be a very likable person. So it does turn out that women leaders have this likability dilemma. Women who are powerful, who are go-getters, who display leadership uh, sort of traits are typically result in this likability dilemma. There is also a lot of research that shows that, you know, women have to be good communicators. They have to have good communication skills in order to be, in order to be elected as leaders. But guess what? This doesn't turn out to be an important trait for men. Men don't have to be good communicators to be elected as leaders. Men just need to, you know, I don't know what, but they certainly having good communication skills certainly doesn't seem to be a requisite, a prerequisite for a man to be elected as a leader. So they are these things. Whether men and women find it difficult, obviously, if you're going to be less liked, then you know you are going to be a bit more hesitant of you know going for that opportunity or going for that leadership role that's going to um, expose you to um, less likability. Sure, thank you. And I think that might answer that um, one of the other questions that we've got here, which is: Were the women taking more of a risk with their own political careers by locking down earlier? I don't know if there's anything that you'd like to add over and above what what you've explained about the-, the Certainly, yeah. certainly. I mean, this has been a very big research agenda and, and it did seem earlier when we were doing the research way back in May, June, that, you know, women were taking a very big risk and they were taking a very big risk. They were completely averse to the loss of lives. And there was a lot of criticism, in fact, coming. A lot of what we found is that women had one objective function. They wanted to save lives. Whereas we find in also in the speeches that male leaders gave, we find that they, were, they had two objective functions. They wanted to save lives, but they also wanted to save their economy. And this made them not very decisive about locking down. This sort of made them hesitant to lock down. They waited for a few more deaths to happen before they declared a lockdown. So we do see this happening. But guess what? It turns out that this dichotomy between lives and economy turned out to be a false one. Those leaders who went after saving lives were also able to open up their economies much earlier. 
And therefore they gained on both fronts. They saved lives and they also ended up saving their economy. So as I said, during I was, when I was talking, I didn't want to go into that point because I didn't want to overrun my time, but that di dichotomy has been proven to be a false one. That's, that's great. Thank you so much. There are another couple of questions there, but I think we might save those to come back to in the Q&A after Jackie's presented as well, if that's okay. So for those of you who have asked those questions, please be reassured we'll come back to them um, in, in the Q&A. Um, so if we could, um, it would be great to move on to uh, Jackie's um, presentation now. Um, so the same, the, the same approach, we'll have about 20 minutes and then we'll open up for um, a, a broader Q&A. I think you're still on mute, Jackie. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, this afternoon. So I'm delighted to be here to, today to celebrate International Women's Day. Um, so thank you, Gretchen, for, for having me here to talk about a subject that's very close uh, to my heart and also central to my research interests, of course. I sense that we're at a, an important time in thinking about the status of women in organizations and in leadership roles in particular, but it's complex. We've um, much to be optimistic about. In the last decade, there have been advances in workplace gender equalities. Progress has been made in recruitment, pipeline, progression, and development of women at work. But there are also many reasons for pessimism. If we look at the emerging patterns over the last few years, the hashtag MeToo campaign, everyday sexism project, reports of sexist corporate cultures, and the continuing effects of harassment at work that have been highly publicized, as well as widespread power abuses, and not least the size of the gender pay gap. And of course, the last 12 months during the COVID-19 pandemic and his significant impact on women in the workplace. Considerable responsibility for failure to address many of these issues needs to be laid at the door of leadership in its many forms. The concept of leadership has also been a central focus of my academic research during the last three decades as I seek to shed new light on what remains seemingly one of the most desired and yet elusive phenomena of our times. A central issue for me in leadership research is the significance of interpersonal relationships and the powerful effect that interactions between leaders and led can have on our lives at work, often with negative consequences. Indeed, everyday stories of organisations are besieged with the harm done by, to the majority by the minority who occupy more powerful positions. We've seen some very interesting discussions emerging over the last 12 months about women in leadership roles and their styles, their behaviours and their approaches, which I'll touch upon, but which Supriya has talked uh, beautifully about already this afternoon. The coronavirus pandemic has served to shed new light on questions of both leadership and the gender landscape, whether at global, national or local levels and across the political, the economic and social contexts. But the seeds of what has been going on were sown long before the recent spotlight placed by the pandemic. And I just wish to explore some of these this afternoon. So there are three themes that I'm hoping to explore in the presentation this afternoon, which was probably rather ambitious for a 20 minute slot. Um, first of all, looking at the paradoxes of leadership in, the, in which both leaders are both lauded um, and denigrated in almost equal measure. Um, secondly, an exploration of some of the gendered workplace cultures and structures and the androcentrism and misogyny that can inform some of these cultures and that can generate barriers to progression. And then finally, and hopefully more optimistically, some thoughts on new futures. So turning to the next slide on, on paradoxes of leadership. 
turning first to the paradox of, of, of interest in the topic of leadership continues to grow, um, spurred on in part, I think, by media attention, which frequently has taken the form of either praising good practices or condemning the malpractices of both individuals and high profile leaders, whether from business or arts or politics or sporting or in other contexts. This paradox has been both the cause and the cure for a range of organizational conditions. And it stays high on the academic and, and the business radar. What's worrying in this enduring fascination with leadership is the undue focus on the senior leader as the organizational hero that romanticizes the influence of the individual leader and it neglects other parties and contexts that are very much at the heart of leadership. Of course, there's much concern amongst leadership scholars that media and popular attention to these heroic figures has further encouraged leaders to concentrate too much power in their own hands. Such attention reinforces the model of power elites as leaders who manipulate organizational uh, lives, discourses, through these structural and cultural norms that are embedded in historical and typically androcentric practices. So these practices reinforce masculine leadership norms and sets of behaviors that often take the form of the competitive, aggressive, controlling, assertive and self-reliant individualist against which both men and women are, are leader, as leaders are judged and many are found wanting as Supriya also referred to. So think here the Donald Trump or the Elon Musk schools of leadership. And this focus on the power elites in politics and in organizational hierarchies have become even more acute during the last, the last 12 months and during the COVID-19 pandemic. So moving to the next um, slide, as I indicated uh, earlier, workplace gender equality has become highly topical over the last few years with media, business and research attention drawn to a number of crises and, and debates. These include myriad exposés that I've mentioned into sexual harassment, power abuse, sexist cultures. Um, more broadly, frontline workers, people with disabilities, older people, women, girls and minorities have been hit especially hard during the pandemic. In a matter of 12 months, there's concern that progress on gender equality has been set back by potentially decades most essential frontline workers are women, and in many countries, they're often from racially and ethnically marginalized groups. Furthermore, most of the increased burden of care in the home has been undertaken by women, as I'll explore shortly. Turning first of all to leadership research, what's curious is that as well as there being no set of prescribed leadership behaviors for anything other than masculine norms, there's no cultural template for a female leader, both in terms of how they look and how they sound. So in relation to how leaders sound, I share Mary Beard's call for us to return to the first principles about the nature of spoken authority, what constitutes it and how we've learned to hear authority where we do. So rather than, for example, pushing women into voice training classes so that they sound more like men, we need to explore the discontinuities and fractures that underlie this dominant masculine discourse. And for me, this requires some old fashioned activism and consciousness raising about what we mean about the voices of authority and how, how we construct authority. But also in terms of other materialities of leaders and more generally of workers, how they look, what they wear, how they operate. We also need to build a new cultural template that surpasses the masculine norms that preclude different ways of being, of presenting ourselves, of behaving. I'm reminded to relate this to the wider experiences in higher education. So there was a, a recent report published in Times Higher last week, reminding us that in the higher education sector, students continue to rate the teaching of women more harshly than that of their male counterparts. 
of equal concern are the findings that women academics are far more likely than men to be evaluated based on their appearance and on their personality. So we need to develop new approaches that recognize other ways of sounding and looking that destabilize these implicit straitjackets of narrow theories, norms and mindsets that continue to dominate. And I think this leads us to a, a further paradox in leadership behaviours. Um, as Supriya has mentioned, women leaders in politics and organisations appear to be thriving and making great strides in the current crisis. And yet they don't display these masculine norms that continue to be valorised. Some of my academic colleagues um, have written about, for example, about Jacinda Ardern and other female role models who've not been constrained by the masculine norms that have hitherto dominated leadership practice. It's the empathy, the shared purpose, the compassion of such leaders that have been celebrated, the very qualities that the COVID-19 crisis seems to, to, to demand. So these ongoing inequalities are curious at a time when we've witnessed significant progress towards gender equality in education, in health, and increasing participation in the workplace, with rising numbers of women in reportedly more powerful positions in the professions, in organizations, in politics, um, et cetera. It was reassuring to hear the news presented by the final Alexander Hampton review reported on the 24th of February, that there have been a 50% increase in FTSE 100 female directors over the last five years, with just over a third of roles in the boardrooms of the top 350 companies also held by females. Although still 16 of these 350 companies have only got one woman on their board. It's also important perhaps to note that women still hold only 14% of executive directorships. So the bulk of women are appointed to non-executive director roles, which don't have the same clout as the director roles. And also that women occupy less than 30% of leadership positions. It's also fair to highlight that there are only 17 female CEOs across all 350 companies. And somewhat depressingly, one major and lingering gendered inequality relates to pay. So a recent report by Topping and Barr has raised concerns about the government's decision to delay gender gap payback gap reporting once more this year, at the very time when evidence suggests growing inequality. So the last available gender pay gap report in 2019 revealed that eight out of 10 British companies paid men more than women. The gender pay gap is still prevalent. Women continue to earn less than men and will accumulate less retirement or superannuation savings. Women do face structural, cultural and informal barriers and are less likely to advance their career, career as far as men. And they are also more likely to experience sexual harassment. At the same time, men have less access to family friendly policies such as parental leave or flexible working arrangements. Although there are early and minority reports during lockdown periods of some change here for those required to work from home. Still, it seems to me that we're far from achieving either a paradigm shift or equality and justice in the workplace. And we know that COVID-19 has had a disproportionate effect on, on women. Women in powerful roles are seen as breaking down barriers. So what are some of those current challenges? Next slide, please. So there are many unanswered questions about the gendered distribution of the workforce and the issue of why there remains an underrepresentation of women in senior organisational roles. In recent years, I've conducted studies of the experiences of men and women in senior leadership roles across the NHS and local government, in higher education, and more recently in the retail sector. What such institutions have in common is the strong presence of women in the bulk of the workforce, and yet the considerable underrepresentation of women in more senior levels. So what's going on? 
Well, in terms of the cultural barriers, as I've said already, this association of leadership and managerial roles as man's domain, so think leadership, think male, is one important factor impeding women's access to and progression within leadership roles. In fact, leadership potential is often described as requiring personal qualities like strength, decisiveness and ambition, which are more readily ascribed to men and masculinity. There are also structural barriers that have surfaced even more acutely during COVID-19, which for the most part stem from lack of work-life balance, limited flexible working arrangements, especially for mothers with young families taking on dual roles of working from home and homeschooling and care. And also the lack of support and development networks in the workplace. It's worth dwelling on this as there are many aspects of the pandemic that have had a disproportionately negative impact on women. Working from home has rocketed, as we know, during the pandemic, something closer to 5% in 2019 to almost 40% last spring. And by summer 2020, more than half of the EU workforce was working from home. The impact of COVID-19 on social change has been considerable with a blurring of work-life boundary beyond recognition. Digital technology had already indicated, had already impacted here, but the pandemic has placed this always on culture into overdrive. Of course, some would say that there are advantages of working from home, comfy clothes, greater flexibility of the working day, less commuting time, improved quality of working life for some. But there are disadvantages too, not least Zoom fatigue, working harder and longer, teaching from our homes, and for many people in cramped housing conditions not set up for such demands. In terms of working hours, EU data suggests that rather than shirking from home, remote staff are working as, 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 as twice as, as likely to, as office-based staff to exceed the 48-hour working week. UK workers were found to increase their working week by 25%, and the survey shows that home workers take shorter lunch breaks, work through their sickness, and are always online, typically logged in for 11 hours a day, up from nine hours a day before March 2020. So this loss of work-life boundary has profound implications, especially for women who also bear the brunt of childcare and domestic chores. And these inequalities are likely to continue beyond the pandemic. Um, there was the House of Commons uh, Women and Equalities Committee report that warns that the government risks turning the clock back on gender equality by overlooking the labour market and caring inequalities faced by women during the pandemic. There's also the lack of gender dis disaggregated evidence and accountability mechanisms that, that I think I've, I've already highlighted. And there are self-imposed barriers. So some of the barriers which explain the dearth of women in leadership are partly caused by our own um, personalities, identities, feelings. They might arise from gender differences in behavior, limited self-promotion, lack of confidence rather than competence. These barriers are mainly due to gender stereotypes and gendered social roles. Um, and indeed, women often report feelings of imposter syndrome. Now, this is interesting to me. There was a recent Harvard Business Review report which urges us to stop telling women that they have imposter syndrome. So the report's authors um, argue that imposter syndrome is another way of pathologizing something that's no more than a feeling of discomfort and mild anxiety that seeks to place blame and responsibility on the individual without accounting for the historical and cultural contexts that are fundamental to how it manifests in women. It also directs attention to fixing the woman rather than fixing the places where women work. What's different for men when they are promoted to senior leadership roles is that they're validated over time. They find role models like them and their competence, leadership skills and contribution is rarely questioned. Women, on the other hand, experience the opposite. And these feelings are exacerbated for minoritized ethnic women. 
so moving on um, to oh, to go beyond that one. Next one, Gretchen, please. Okay, so my final slide. So what can we do about it? Returning to the sub theme of my presentation, it's time to care. As I've said already, the responsibility for domestic care and homeschooling for women with younger families has fallen more broadly onto women during the pandemic, and that needs to be addressed. But it's also time to care for these women and men in the workplace. Leadership is best viewed as a collective, collaborative and relational work of many people in organisations. So we need to steer a course away from this dominant, uh, gendered, predominantly male leader figure. We need to shift the association of power with this, this elite. Uh, we falsely equate confidence with competence, and this is a major undoing in recruitment selection and progression. Um, we need to move towards more equitable and sustainable approaches rather than self-interested leaders. We need to have this ethics of care in leadership. So it is time to care, both in terms of recognising the time that women have already invested in caring in domestic contexts, but also in creating a workplace environment that better reflects this ethics of care. So to conclude, the COVID-19 pandemic, through what it reveals about vulnerabilities at the heart of organisational life, has prompted many of us to reflect learning from our experiences during the pandemic and thinking through the theme of this year's International Women's Day of choosing to challenge. We need to call out gender bias and inequality. The absence of women from core leadership roles is not of their making. Women continue to face a combination of discrimination, harassment and structural barriers which keeps them out of the top of institutions that govern our public, political and economic life. So without some direct intervention, progress will remain far too slow. We also need to embed equality, diversity and inclusion into the DNA of our businesses and organisations. We need to seek out and celebrate women's achievements and we need to create an inclusive world and organisations that are more resilient, inclusive and responsible. My sense is that we can achieve this through an approach that, to leadership that better adopts this ethics of care. Or as organisation scholar Jennifer Howard Grenville has recently suggested, we need to adopt an approach that has at its heart care, courage and curiosity. Right, I will stop there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, if it's okay, I'll stop sharing your slides as well. Um, I, I think that's given us, given us so much to think about and so many great um, ideas and thoughts and provocations also to thinking about the um, the future and what we can what we can do better. Um, I'm just catching up on the Q&A because I wasn't able to see it while um, I went to. OK, and I'll give a chance. There's a couple of questions still there from um, Supriya's talk. So I'll give a chance for people to um, to add their, their questions in the Q&A session. And I think I'd like to ask both of you, because you've given us such a great insight into some of the, the challenges, but also the possibilities, I think, around women's leadership. And so. I, I guess bringing it back to the university context, um, what can we do as universities to prepare and empower women, both students and staff, to become the successful leaders that you've identified or that you've talked about what we might be able to, to come, become? So, if you have any thoughts. <laughs> um, I can go first. Okay. Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, Gretchen, thank you for that question. I have actually thought a little bit about this. Um, and before I give you my answer, may I please share a very short story? You know, very recently, one of the, our departments at the university had a vacancy for uh, the director of research. And this subject area is one of those where women are very heavily, very seriously underrepresented. 
especially in higher uh, positions. So I was just talking to this head of department and I happened to mention to him that there's actually a very capable woman in their group because, you know, I've worked with her before and I know her fairly well. And I said, you know, he should really, you know, sort of encourage her to put an application to this role because I have a feeling that she'll do really well. So he said, oh, oh, oh I can't do that. That would be really not uh, looking as fair and transparent. Um, I, I, I'm just going to look for whoever applies and then I will select whoever is the best of the applications. As it turned out to be, this woman never applied, no woman applied, and the role went to uh, one of the men who applied. There were two men who applied for the role, I know, because we looked at the applications later. So the, the, the moral of the story is really simple, and this is kind of a universal thing. It also connects to some of the things that Jackie was talking about earlier. That, you know, one thing that we know is that women are equally capable as men are in most contexts, but what they do lack is they lack confidence. So if universities could somehow, universities have institutionalized the idea of disengagement when they are looking to appoint someone internally to higher uh, sort of leadership positions. And I believe they now need to internalize this idea of encouraging women. This is really truly embracing the idea of diversity in leadership. Women do lack in confidence. I would have loved to go and speak to this woman and love to have encouraged her to apply, but it was not my place to do so. And I thought, you know, my place was to, to sort of talk to the head of department. But really, I think if universities want to do one thing, they have done this already when they, you know, advertise um, for roles um, for external, sort of when they are appointing someone externally, there's a clear sentence that says, women applicants are encouraged to apply. Use the same idea internally, internalize this. I mean, someone needs to talk to this head of department saying that, you know, it's important for you to encourage women to apply to the senior roles. If we look at how roles are divided, we find that women are mainly in pastoral roles. They put themselves forward for pastoral roles because they believe they are going to be good at this, but they don't put themselves forward to decision-making roles, to roles which have decisions on resource allocation. And this is where universities need to proactively encourage women. I don't believe in quotas. I think quotas backfire. I think having quotas for women is just a bad idea. But I think women do need to be encouraged in order to you know, seek out opportunities. I'll stop there. Thanks so much. I just, just, yeah, just a slight, slightly different approach, really, and think about, you know, what can we as, as staff members or, or students do to, um, to become successful leaders? And I think there are three or four things, maybe. One is to find a mentor and, and you know, get into a mentoring relationship with somebody. Maybe to join a, a network group um, of like-minded people and to boost your sense of confidence and competence uh, through that um, but we can always always support other people so if you think about well okay I'm going to support two other women in more junior positions um, and that will escalate in, in across the organization and I think finally for me it's about being affirmed of your own style um, being comfortable in the style that you have which might well be different from the, the norms and the mindset. So be prepared to be a bit different. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Susan, I think you would like to make a comment there as well. Yes, I would, um, if, if I may. I think uh, what Supriya is, is raising there is, is very important, but it's, it's not always easy um, because, and I hesitate to say this in front of, 56 others across the institution, I will go and uh, talk to people individually. Um, and in previous existences, I have gone and talked to individuals um, when I wasn't a head of department or anything like that. Um, and I think it's important that we do that. I think that is individual action we can take. And I think that um, in terms of, you know, if, if people want to sit back and wait to see who applies, then anything where there is a, a vast outnumbering of men will always mean that there are more men, vast outnumbering of one ethnicity, there will always be those. So, so we don't 
really get very far. Um, I think I think I agree with you on quotas, although I think I, I sway, I, I waver around on that one. But the real point I wanted to make as well is another very real issue that we mustn't lose sight of is that because women by and large do have the bulk of caring responsibilities, even if that's not formally allocated in their domestic um, arenas, they tend to absorb more of that. Often, and I think this is a harder one to crack, often the leadership roles are roles that they don't necessarily want to take on or they don't want to take on the big ones because it's yet another burden. And I think that's an even more difficult uh, item to crack um, in terms of how we, how we, as leaders of universities, how we structure other leadership roles to make them able to be done by people who have more responsibilities uh, outside of the work environment in such a way as they're not going to go crazy trying to do these roles. Super. Thanks very much, Susan. Some, some real challenges, I think, ahead of us. Um, going back to the Q&A, and please do post questions in the Q&A if you've got them. Um, there's a couple of questions uh, left over um, from Supriya's presentation earlier on, if we can just revisit those quickly. And there was a question, Supriya, which leadership characteristic do you admire the most? All oh, right. Um, well, what can I say? I'm totally in love with Jacinda Ardern. <laughs> I, I, she's just been amazing. She, um, she has got no hesitation to show what she is. Um, she can even dance a jig in front of a camera when she's really happy about something that, you know, she's received a report about something. I remember this time when in June they said New Zealand was free of COVID, the very first country to be to have had COVID and then to become free of it. Um, that that was just like she just showed herself. Um, I'm just a fan of hers. Particular characteristic. I mean, there's also Angela Merkel. The way she talks to people about really complex science. I mean, I, I've watched that video of hers where she explains R carefully. I, I'm not a German speaker. I had to use subtitles, but she does explain it so intuitively. I thought that was fantastic. So there are really various things that women leaders have done that have been absolutely brilliant. Um, I think the way women communicate is just fantastic. So, you know, I used to earlier think that I have to sit in a certain way, use my hands only minimally, but now I just do whatever I want to, because I mean, these women are fascinating. The, they ju just be yourself. I think that's what I've really loved about these women, you know, um, she's, they just go off the track and try and do something. If you look at how Erna Solberg talks to children, she just sort of bends down and speaks to individual kid about the virus, about it's okay to be anxious. So I think it's the communication styles of leaders that has appealed to me the most, I would say. So yes. And, and every leader has had their own differences, um, you know, different styles of communication, but each one has, has had something to give. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, and there's another uh, question there about wondering whether or not there um, is a greater depth or diversity of female representation within the upper levels of governments. Um, so a greater diversity in cabinet of the countries that have, have seen to have done better read the pandemic. So maybe not just one leader, but a greater diversity of the whole cabinet. Yeah, I mean, that would be just wonderful research to do. Um, you know, one of the challenges that we had in our research was data gathering. Even to figure out whether the leader was male or female was really difficult at times. One country was Namibia, where the head of state was both a male and a female, but the head of government was a male. So we really had to do some deep study in order to understand how to sort of, you know, which group to put Namibia in. Ultimately, we ended up putting it as a male-led country, but that's besides the point. So I think really the big issue here would be data. To get this kind of data would be just amazing. And to have enough sample in order to do a rigorous study would be just fantastic. There is one, by the way, that has come up. It's in uh, the Journal of Psychology and they look at, um, I'm sure if you can search for it, it'll come up um, in the Google search engines. 
they U.S. governors, and there is a fair variation in terms of gender in U.S. governors. So that is going to the next level. But going at a, they don't do it at national level. They look at within the U, U, U.S. and they look at governors, and that's that has been an interesting study. And interestingly, they they sort of agree with what we find. Great. Thanks, Supriya. Um, we have a, a question here too, a, a, a more general one, I think, about, um, but a very hard one. What can be done to restructure the systems deliberately designed to marginalise women in the workplace, particularly systems around promotions? So I don't know who would like to take that one on for a start. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll start off maybe. Um, well, I think one of the core issues for me is around transparency, um, you know, that, that we need to have transparent processes of not just progression but starting before that recruitment selection then career progression and development and pay and all of the other facets um, and unless we start chipping away at some of these structural in inequalities um, then then I think we're going to continue to 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 have difficulties and I think that all of this performance related criteria needs to be revisited in the post pandemic period as well, because what worked okay before COVID may not fit anymore. Um, and I think it's the same with this House of Commons report about, you know, doing equity checks um, on, on policies and processes. I think we need to do the same in our organisations for the future about promotion, about recruitment in the light of the impact um, of the pandemic, differential impact of the pandemic on, on women. Thanks so much, Jackie. Supriya or Susan, I don't know if you'd like to add anything to that. Yes, I'm happy to do so. I mean, it's really um, important what, what Jackie's saying and I, I agree totally with her. I have to say we're, there is a huge difference now um, in Durham in respect of uh, certainly recruitment where um, departments and the heads of um, search committees have to engage very deeply with the question of diversity gender being one of the dimensions and obviously uh, different ethnicities and, and origins of, of people um, in all sorts of ways. And, and that is heavily contested. Um, and I, I can see that the progress that's being made there, but there's no doubt it's slow progress. Um, in terms also of uh, promotion um, as well, that it's we, we, we are looking and there has been, um, there have been reports on what percentage of the promotions process uh, at Durham is uh, resulting in what level of promotions by, again, different groupings. And it's very clear that the promotions policy that we had um, of everybody submitting um, a shortened CV into um, their departmental promotions committee has resulted in a net increase in female progressions over the last two to three years that it's been in place. So there is progress being made um, and we need to learn from where if that's not working as well, why it's not. Uh, and I think we have to be brave to be proactive um, and sometimes being proactive in these spheres does get um, some criticism more broadly that you're privileging women or you're privileging ethnic minorities. Um, but, um, I, well, from my own personal perspective, I, I, I do it anyway. I ask forgiveness, not permission to do that. Thank you so much. Supriya, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Uh, no, not really. I mean, I agree with both. Um, uh, I think transparency is extremely important. Most of the grievances come because of lack of transparency. And I can imagine that, you know, the SMT and the SLT and universities don't really have an easy job. They do need to balance various priorities out. And a lot of people are now waiting for promotions. So it'll be, you know, the, they were sort of put on hold whole of last year. So it'll be interesting to see how the university copes with this, you know, inundated requests for promotions. Um, so yes, I mean, I can totally understand that they don't have an easy uh, decision to take. Thank you very much. 
Um, we have another question, and I think this might work at multiple levels of, say, university and business organisations and country leadership and so on. But how do we break the cycle of getting the leaders we think we want instead of those we need? At the moment, it feels that no one has an internalised model of leadership that would cause women to think they could be good le leaders or for people to realise they are when they do end up leading. And can we be taught to be better followers? That's quite a complex. <laughs> I was trying to think it through. I mean, I think for me, there's something about um, recognition um, and mutuality of recognition. So um, in relational approaches to leadership where you, you recognize both the leader and the follower, so the leader and the led, um, that you can, um, you can have a, a better sort of co-relationship that, that boosts um, that. Um, I mean, for me, the only way out of it is to stop thinking that the narrow mindset con and constraints that traditional models are, are following. So to open up cultural diversity and inclusivity um, so that we, we break this mold of always having the same old uh, approach. Um, and and rec so recognition, so endorsing, giving feedback to people um, that they are doing a good job, that they are showing the characteristics that are, are, are positive um, in terms of leadership. But it's and for me, Gretchen, I think that is a terrific question. It's just, it is so complicated uh, and it gets right to the heart of many matters. Um, I mean, I remember what, I had a leadership job very young in my career, too young, actually, I would say now. Um, but at the time, um, I took it and uh, it was really tough. And I ended up leaving that organization um, a couple of years later, uh, just feeling as if I wasn't making a difference and I, you know, I, I wasn't leading properly um, or I couldn't see the effect of my leadership anywhere. And it was interesting because when I had handed in my notice, um, uh, there were members of the, of the department I was working in at that time all came to me and said, why are you leaving? You're doing a good job. And I thought you needed to tell me that. I had no, no, partly that was my fault. Partly I was young, I was immature. Uh, I didn't know how to get that feedback. Um, I was very aware that, you know, when a leader asks, how am I doing? It's a brave person that says, well, you know, pet, you've got more to do here. Um, but um, at the same time, so I, I would be better equipped to get that kind of feedback. And we have other tools that are routinely used, like the 365s, uh, for example. Um, but at that time, I do remember feeling a little bit tinge of sadness because I'd wanted to make a difference uh, to this place. And I felt as if I was getting nowhere. And, and clearly those above me um, didn't want me to make that difference. And they were making it really hard. But I didn't feel there was a, you know, there was just enough stickiness around me to, to help that. So, so I moved. And I think that that happens as well, unless you've got a particularly thick skin and, and, uh, and bang on anyway, which I didn't. Thank you. I think I imagine too that some of the suggestions that Jackie made about um, ways that we could manage in the future with more collaborative and um, approaches and so on would perhaps break down some of those um, fears that followers might have about talking to their leaders about things that are going on. There would be a more open communication that would happen, I suppose, with fewer kind of hierarchies and levels involved in a way that might put people off from saying things, I imagine, as well. Um, we have another question here around quotas. And um, if we don't use quotas, how are we going to create a step change? Um, and so the, the um, person has commented that we've been talking about these, these issues for, for many, many years and not really seen any change. Um, so how can we make the right change happen if we're not um, if we're not gonna use quotas. Susan, I think this question is for you. <laughs> can, before Susan answers, can I just make, make a quick comment? Cause I, I share this, this view really about, um, and then Susan can give us the answer, but without direct <laughs> intervention, um, you know, including quotas, targets, greater flexible working, collecting intersectional data, 
um, improved gender pay gap reporting, um, I think progress will be far, far too slow. Thank you. Well, Jackie, you're very kind. I don't, I don't have the answer, but I'm interested in what Supriya had to say because I, I think you said you weren't really in favour of quotas, and I think if I'm, I'm just laying my cards on the table. I think I probably am, but at the same time, I do understand that it is a, um, it's an unpopular view. And, and, and what do I mean by unpopular? There, I mean that you know, out there in the ether, I think quotas are generally seen to be a bad thing, and I can never really understand the reasons why they're a bad thing, because, um, no, yeah. I, I, I just don't understand. So I'm, I'm interested to try and get a better handle on what the rationale for not wanting quotas really is, because I think I'm kind of of the view that, you know, um, to use the, <laughs> the metricization against the orthodoxy, you do what's measured. If we're not measuring it, it's not gonna get done. Yeah, so I'm actually in favor of all the other things that Jackie just mentioned there, gender pay gap, all those things need correcting, absolutely no doubt, and they need correcting proactively. But I do have a worry about quotas. If you do have quotas, if you do support quotas, and in some contexts they have been really useful. Um, for instance, proactively supporting, um, you know, the education of ethnic minorities in certain countries has proven to be a really useful policy, especially America stands out to be a case in point. But with quotas, what happens is women who actually do end up reaching uh, the top management, the top leadership positions, there is always a worry about whether they reach there because of their quotas or whether they actually deserve to be where they are. And women end up having to defend themselves, having to do, and, and that's a really terrible position to put women in. Um, I mean, I'm not in that position. I've never been in that position, but I can just imagine that if there was a quota for let's say professors, X number of professors in economics need to be women, and if I then became a professor tomorrow, then my colleagues are going to wonder whether I became a professor because of this quota or I really deserve to be a professor. And in that context, I would hate to be in a position where I become a professor because I would look like, you know, I'm filling a quota. So I think putting women in that position, saying that, you know, there are quotas for women, I think that's really, going to be counterproductive in the long run. We have to carefully look at whether quotas are required or not, and then use them very, very, very minimally, I would say, and with a lot of circumspection if they are being used. Thank you so much. Um, on that very interesting issue with lots of different um, angles and, and arguments against um, and for, for quotas. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to bring our panel to an end. Athena has informed me that the, the panel that follows this is not able to be started until this one has been finished. So we'll, we're just unfortunately going to have to bring us to a close a couple of minutes early. Um, but I would like to finish off by saying a few words of thanks before saying goodbye to everybody. Of course, firstly, thank you very much to Athena, um, who has been uh, working very hard behind the scenes to to um, to help us with the technology today, but more importantly, putting uh, so much work into organising the events of International Women's Day at the university today. So thanks, Athena. Um, and also thank you very much to uh, Professor Susan Hart for her wonderful introduction to today's panels and um, contributions to the discussion following. Please also thank me um, in in. Uh, please also join me in thanking uh, Supriya and Jackie for telling us all about their interesting and, and really thought-provoking work and for engaging in such a fascinating discussion. We've got questions left still, so people will go away thinking about these, these things for a while to come. But um, finally, thank you all for taking the time to, to join us today. Um, there's been some great questions and comments, and I'm sorry we couldn't address all of the questions, um, but we do hope you'll take something from this which might help you to choose to challenge as we all work towards a more gender equal world. So happy International Women's Day to all of you. And thank you. Thank you. Thanks thank everyone. You. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thanks.